You are listening to episode 77 of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today we're going to talk sourdough, and for that I'm bringing on a special guest, Angela from Axe and Root Homestead. She has been a sourdough baker for over four years. She creates beautiful bread on her homestead, shares her life over on her Instagram, Axe and Root Homestead. We are just going to chat as two lovers of sourdough, so let's dive in. This episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast is sponsored by Berkey Water Filters. Berkey just announced their big holiday sales starting this week. It goes through Black Friday where you can get up to 30% off the bundle deals. So if you're ready to get started with a Berkey Water Filter, I've talked extensively about why we love them, so you probably already know. If not, I have blog posts on it. If you go to farmhouseonmoon.com and search Berkey, you can find it there. It is the water filter we have been using in our home for over 10 years now. You can find the holiday sale at bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash farmhouse holiday bundles. I noticed when you get on the landing page, you put in your email address and then all of the prices pop up. So you can see that there. Again, that's bit.ly slash farmhouse holiday bundles. My name is Lisa, mom of six and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. We ended up having a little bit of trouble with the audio, just like I did on my last podcast episode too, which I'm finally getting sorted out. So if it drives you crazy, we ended up using a different way to record around eight minutes. So if it is driving you nuts, you can go ahead and skip ahead and get to the good audio, but you might miss a little bit. So just depending on whether or not it drives you nuts that our microphones were acting up around the eight minute mark all is well again and the audio is crystal clear well yeah we'll just dive right in i mean thanks so much for coming on here with me and talking yeah. sourdough um thank you for having me yeah i'll introduce you a little bit in the intro and okay. you know talk about your instagram but um yeah i guess we can just dive right into sourdough okay sounds good so yeah i have a little a little list of things but what's what's something that you feel like just diving right in well actually let's just start at the beginning how long have you had a sourdough starter <laughs> is it a new thing for you or barely so i have um a sourdough starter that a friend actually passed along to me from her batch um about three and a half years ago almost four now so my, oh, wow. my sourdough journey is fairly new and it is at four years old (laughs) doesn't seem too new most people started it during quarantine okay well oh yes i'm 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 more established than that but my sourdough (laughs) starter is named zach bread run what is that zach (laughs) bread run so i'll let you figure out who that's named after but that is mine if it's like a cultural reference i guarantee you i won't know it if i tell it to my husband he'll be able to figure it out all right well it's zach efron the actor so it's Zach. okay there you go gotcha yeah i am the worst i don't know i mean most people who probably are like extremely famous could walk into this house and i would not know who they were (laughs) you know that's not necessarily a bad thing though that's okay it's because i can't stay awake when i'm watching tv me me neither (laughs) before homesteading sure i could stay up late but now i gotta get up and run my butt off all day long i can't stay up right (laughs) even when i was younger i remember all of my friends would watch saturday night live and i wanted so bad to be able to understand what they were talking about i could never stay up late enough to see it oh really (laughs) nope i don't think i've ever seen an episode (laughs) oh sad are you an early riser do you get up early yeah i do i do there you go it's about can't stay up Yeah. yeah so yeah all right so with that what is something that you feel like is a misconception about sourdough I definitely have some in my head yeah but what would you say I think and I was there too before I started working with it that sourdough is completely intimidating it's something that is going to take a long time to master it's hard to maintain a starter and recipes take hours if not days to actually go from start to finish and I think all of that is nonsense those are the things that kept me from starting my sourdough or my relationship, if you will, with sourdough, because I just didn't want a huge time commitment. And I'm not a huge baker. I didn't run around and bake cookies when I was stressed out or make cakes for every single celebration. I'm not really into that. Yeah. 
but the bread idea, making homemade fresh bread, that's something that I could really get behind. I don't like preservatives. I like that it comes from my own kitchen. And so then once I decided to finally dive in and give it a try and having a friend that had some experience helped. It's so easy. It really is. You don't have to be a baker to bake sourdough. Right. Wouldn't you agree? I Oh, yeah, that's exactly what I would say as well. I actually saw on something recently, somebody was comparing it to another child. I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Sourdough is nowhere near. And I even hear a lot of homesteaders say things like, I needed to take a break for a while. I only do dehydrated. I don't find it complicated at all. I really don't. It doesn't take a big effort. I mean, especially because these are the same people who go out and milk their cow every day. Right. Right. You know, that's a big, maybe that's why they're just super busy, but yeah, it seems like they, they definitely are familiar with commitment and sourdough feels like way less than that. Totally. I mean, I think the other thing is too, some people, okay. So they say that sourdough actually has a quote unquote memory that it can sort of predict how often and when it should be fed. And if it's not fed up to that frequency, it'll go flat quicker. Like if you normally feed two, even three times a day, if it's not getting that and getting the nutrition that it's used to, it's not going to fare well without some adjustment. Okay. That being said, if you're going to be low maintenance with your sourdough starter, feed it once every 24 hours, right around the time period that you're going to bake and then stick it in the refrigerator. Like I do the rest of the time. It's totally low maintenance. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I go through phases. So I go through phases where the sourdough starter is out on the counter all day, every day for weeks at a time. I'm making stuff every single day. But then I go through phases where it's in the back of the fridge for two weeks. Yeah. And it never has failed me. It always just bounces right back. Agreed. And I also, I have fed it different flowers. Have you gone from, you know, you run out of, you run out of your good flower and you go to all purpose mm-hmm. and then it's pine corn and then it's rye. I've tried to destroy mine and I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have probably crafted a very robust starter. <laughs> yeah, mine's about 10 at this point. Wow, that's amazing. So the craziest that I've gotten is to flip back and forth between all-purpose and bread flour. And I had to do that with the whole quarantine thing when the stores were running out of flour like crazy and you couldn't get it online. So there was some adjustments to be made there. But normally I'm I'm pretty um, consistent with my feeding regimen. Okay. Well, I think probably in the beginning I wouldn't have thought that'd be a good idea. Mm-hmm. And then I just over time, like you said, I've taken liberties just because I've had to, Yeah, you know, there's been times where certain flowers weren't available. And so it was the only option. Yeah. But yeah, I've gone from uh, einkorn that I've milled at home to all purpose einkorn to unbleached all purpose to all purpose that's been bleached. It always turns out fine. So then how does that work? You notice the taste difference if you're, if you're, if you're baking with just an all purpose or a bread flour or something like that, do you taste any of the einkorn? That may have been in there at one point? Um, probably, but usually I get mine down pretty low before I feed it again. Yeah. What's some of the reasons that you decided to get and maintain a sourdough starter? Like what actually motivates you to keep that in your kitchen? Um, so I guess it falls in line with my values as a homesteader. I want things to be as fresh as possible. Um, I like to have control over the ingredients that are in my food and try to avoid preservatives that are overly processed and manufactured. And then there's also just nothing like fresh bread baking in the kitchen, right? It creates a certain sort of atmosphere and a feel to the home, especially during the colder months that's awfully cozy. Yeah, and then during the whole pandemic earlier in the year, you couldn't even find yeast anywhere. So that's why I think the surge happened because obviously you can rise bread without buying yeast. So it becomes, you know, if bread's a basic thing to keep you alive, you need it to rise. And sourdough starter is the natural way to do that. Yeah, that was pretty crazy when you couldn't find sourdough or excuse me, when you couldn't find um, yeast and flour nowhere. No. And I had people reaching out to me like, can I make a sourdough starter with coconut? How about with almonds? Like they couldn't find any flour either. So they wanted to know like, what else can I make a starter with? God, that's so crazy. And you can make a gluten-free starter, but I have to admit, it's just really not that good. I'm sorry, gluten-free people. <laughs> it's just not. It's just not. That's good. interesting to hear you say, because I do get a lot of inquiries from people about, do I have a gluten-free starter, which I don't? Do I know anyone that does? Unfortunately, I don't. And I know it's out there. I know you can do it. I just don't know. I can't speak to the quality of it. So that's interesting to hear you say that it's not maybe as 
good is the real thing? I mean, I guess just gluten-free anything, bread, you know, it's just not, I don't know. So I have a tutorial on my blog on how to do a gluten-free sourdough starter. I made mine with brown rice flour. I did that. And then I also did a buckwheat one. And then, so that I, I kept that for a while. And then ultimately I got rid of it because I just didn't want to keep two starters alive, especially when I'm not really using the gluten-free one very right. much. I really should have given it to somebody. It was just, ugh, I just got sick of feeding it. And I just, I let it go. But I tried experimenting with a gluten-free sourdough bread and I came up with something that looked like bread, but I don't know what gluten-free bread supposed to taste like, but this was, this was not bread. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was like gummy and cakey oh, and no. super dense. It was not my favorite thing. So it looked good, but it wasn't exactly what you had in mind. No. And so what I tell people is if you're not celiac, so you're not extremely allergic to gluten, but maybe just a little bit sensitive, you could get a tablespoon of starter from a friend, or you could start a wheat starter and then just take a tablespoon of it out and feed it mostly gluten-free flours. It'll always have residual amounts of gluten and wheat in it, but the yeast will take it over and it will be a gluten-free starter, but it won't be, it'll never be 100% gluten-free. So if you're just sensitive, I would say that'd be a really good option. But if you're allergic. That's interesting. That's good to know. Yeah. I, would, I mean, I would think it would work. I haven't actually tried it, but I also have fed my starter every flower under the sun. So I don't see why it wouldn't convert over to something gluten-free. Worth a shot. I don't know. I was going to say, especially that Bob's Red Mill, that one-to-one -one seems to be a popular gluten-free flour for baked goods and bread. Well, in looking back, I should have done that. I actually just went with gluten-free flours, but I didn't really... I didn't do that, and I, I now I can see the value in that pre-mixed, you know, ratios and everything. And so, yeah, yeah, I'd probably recommend doing that. But that's not what I did at the time. Hindsight yeah. is twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I saw on your, I was looking at your sourdough highlight on your Instagram, and you were doing a little bit of troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. What would you tell someone how to look for if it's gone bad? I have actually had super good luck with my starter. I've never question whether it's gone bad. It just never, just never looked like it was. So what are some of the things you look for? Sure. So fortunately for me as well, my sourdough starter has always been good. I've never had a problem, but I have had a friend who had a problem and, um, I did see it. And so I can say firsthand from experience what that looked and smelled like. First okay. of all, all sourdough starters, it's a fermented food. So it's worth noting that it has a fermented, almost vinegar-like smell, right? That's totally normal. Yeah, it can smell bad. like Or not bad, but like what you might perceive as bad. Right. So if you think of the tangy smell that like apple cider vinegar has, it's going to have that. It should have that. That's healthy, right? Because it's a, it's a fermented, good bacteria food. When it starts to smell like cheese or moldy feet, you've gone, you've gone awry. <laughs> Something's wrong. Okay. So it had, I mean, I think our bodies are naturally very good at sort of telling us, you know, sense of smell is a protective mechanism. You just kind of know when something's off. If it smells like vinegar, fine. If it smells like sour gone bad, sour milk, mold, you're going to know you're going to smell it. The other thing to look for is color. So for people who don't know with sourdough starter, you'll get a thin layer of naturally fermented alcohol on the top called hooch. And that's totally normal, especially if you keep it in the refrigerator, you take it out, give it a stir all as well. But when that gets to go from like a clear or just a light gray color to a seriously like opaque gray, black could be green or pink. If it's a questionable color like that, you ha probably have a problem, you have some sort of a contamination. And at that point, you know, you can read articles online and people will say, oh, just, you know, take a little bit of it so you can keep a bit of the yeast and over time just keep feeding it and it'll correct. I don't mess with it. I don't wanna have any sort of a contaminated item in my kitchen. So I, my recommendation to my friend was just toss it. I'll give you some of mine and you can start over. Right. Well, and I could, you know, especially when you have a thriving starter at your home, I am sort of in the camp of it'll balance out over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now I, there's definitely times when they've gone completely bad. I'm sure of that, but I think that they are pretty rare and I get people reaching out to me all the time who think that their starter has gone bad in like the first seven days. And at that point, usually it just needs to 
it needs to balance out and it'll yeah. find its balance. So I do think sometimes people are overly quick about tossing out their starters. And I've had people who said, I've tried five times and I still, I'm like, I think you might just be tossing out too quickly, quite honestly. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I've never seen one that's been all the way bad. So I can't completely say, I will say that my hooch can get black. I mean, I've definitely seen it black. Oh really? Like dark black? Oh yeah, that's regular. Really? But I've never seen it pink or, op or like clear or anything like that. But dark, yes, I've seen that often. You know, and I think there's something to be said too for the circumstances. Like you obviously sourdough starter needs to breathe. And so if somebody's keeping it in an airtight lid or airtight jar on the counter and not feeding it, I mean, I've actually heard of jars exploding because they are trying to breathe and there's pressure that builds. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's for sure. I've exploded other ferments as well. Yeah. That people, people are like, that sounds scary. I'm like, it does happen. Yeah. If you, especially like I've made, I make a lot of uh, water kefir and you want to keep it in an airtight jar so that it builds up that carbonation. But if you go too long, it'll sound like gunshots in your house. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, so my sister and I, we've both, we both exploded our ferments before, but I've never stored sourdough in an airtight. I don't see any reason to, because I don't want it to get, I don't really need that pressure to build up right. for any reason, taste wise or anything, you know? There are situations where you would want some sort of a cover, right? Like in this, like just naturally occurring dust. You don't necessarily want that. Oh yeah. Food, that's fine. I mean, use a cheesecloth, use a paper towel. I have a glass jar that just has one of those loose fitting lids that sits right on top. And I usually yes. do still just kind of slide it to the side. I think you have the same jar. Yep. Yeah, I yeah. do. I and do. So that sits on there. Yeah, that there. one works great. Right. And then, you know, in the summertime, a lot of us, especially with home gardens, we experience fruit flies. And oh, so yeah. those love the fermented odors that come from a sourdough starter. So you do need some sort of a covering. It's just you wouldn't want an airtight, you know, environment. Right. Yes. Especially if it's hot outside, you will probably explode pretty quickly if you yes. put on an airtight lid. <laughs> that would not be good. So how's your starter doing right now? I mean, is it cold at your, cold in your house? I actually have it on my counter in front of me right now. Um, so I just fed it this morning. My situation is a little different because I do sell sourdough starter in its liquid That's form. That's right. Yeah. Yes. So some people dehydrate it and sell it because it's just easier to package, but I, um, I sell it in glass jars. And I never really have to discard. A lot of people discard, and that's the normal part of sourdough keeping. You know, you toss it or you make something with that discard. But for me, um, I've gotten pretty good at balancing the stock that I need for our own bread supply in addition with what I use to sell. So I usually have about probably three sourdough starters going out every day. So that's a quite a bit. Okay. I actually just mailed a sourdough starter yesterday. I don't sell them, but I do mail them to people who like, there's a lady who lives in my old town. It's an hour away. So I could bring it to her, but it, and I also could just ship it for three bucks. Yeah. And I just, I've never thought about putting it in a glass jar. So how do you keep the, like, how do you package it? To avoid that explosion discussion we just had. <laughs> so right. I, I never mail freshly fed sourdough starter. Like I wouldn't take the batch that I just fed after packaging. I wouldn't feed it, then package it. Cause it's gonna- Oh want no, to that's ferment. exactly what I did. And that's what I do when I send it. I'm like, oh, this way it's basically doing its ferment on the way. Well, <laughs> you know what? Maybe you're okay cause the temperatures are cooler. But in the summertime, right. Yeah, you run the risk of exploding, especially if you mail it over a weekend because it's going to sit stagnant mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah, I usually spring for uh, priority. So I also mail a lot of kefir grains. That that was like my one of my first businesses, and I've sold like a thousand orders of kefir grains because they expand, but I haven't done the starters. And I just do them in a Ziploc and then another Ziploc, which I know is not super sustainable, but I'm like, well, at least it wouldn't explode. <laughs> I don't know. Right, it wouldn't explode and it doesn't leak. No, but I started doing the glass jars. They're just flasks. And, um, you know, I, I mail like half a cup or so starter at a time and um, it's glass, so it's good. It's non-reactive. It comes with right. a tamper-proof lid. And then the, the, the flask is reusable because we're an eco-friendly homestead, so people can reuse their flask. And then it also works for us from a business standpoint because 
These are the same exact flasks that we bottle our home tapped maple syrup and our honey in. Oh, I didn't know you had all this. Yes. It's so, just one jar so let's go there. Is it axenroothomestead.com that you have yeah. all this stuff? And then in the shop and then in farm goods. And that's where you'll okay. find all that stuff. Fire cider mix, elderberry syrup mix. All of our stuff is there. Oh, wow. That's great. I love that because I, I do get a lot of people asking me if I'll mail a sourdough starter. And, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work to just to do that unless it's your business, mm -hmm. you know, because... Yes, you have the starter. It doesn't really cost anything, but getting it all packaged up into the post office, I'm always like, eh. usually I'll just do it to, to friends around here who yeah. would like a starter or family, things like right. that. But that's a great idea because it does take effort to start a starter. And then with having one that's already established, especially I like that you sell it just liquid because mm -hmm. I don't know, there's a learning curve to rehydrating things. Yes. I think so too. I don't see it. Where's your starter? So if you Oh, go under shop, farm goods. Yeah, I got it. Never mind. I didn't goods. see that. Okay. Yep. Also, I with my starter, if I mail it to somebody, I pack it with flour and make it really thick. Is that what you do as well? Actually, because of the size of our flasks, like it's got that bottleneck on it. I keep Oh, it they have to pour it, right? Pour out. If somebody has to put it into okay. their, their storage container and so I don't thicken it to like what I would normally have. So some people are like, this is too thin. And then I say, okay, well next time, you know, when you go to feed, add your flour yeah. first and then start just adding a small amount of water. Don't add the full amount and just reach the consistency that you like. And that's something else I think that people don't understand about sourdough or maybe aren't aware of is that it is really hard to screw it up. You know, there's all exactly. these Exactly, yeah, ratios. it really is. Yeah, there's all these ratios about feeding and timing. Really, you can just play with it. Like there's room to play. If you're nervous, divide up your starter and feed multiple starters. And if, if you want to experiment with it and then just find the consistency that you like. And that's all it really needs is flour and water, right? As long as it has those right. two things, it's going to be happy and healthy. Well, right. Like you send, you send this, they just pour it into the flour, add water until it's the consistency they want. If I send it thick, she just needs to add more water and flour. It doesn't, it, it, the ratios are not important. I get They're that not. question all the time because I've switched it around on my blog a little bit because different feedback and people are like, wait, what is it? Is it a cup? Or, I'm like, seriously, yeah. it doesn't matter. <laughs> but it doesn't. I'll... And you know, a lot of people that are getting starter, right? They tend to be on the side of a new sourdough baker. Um, maybe there's a handful of people that have baked and um, gave it up or maybe their starter went bad. But for the most part, these people that are ordering it have never experienced baking with a starter before. So I do send an instruction sheet and it does say, all right, for the first feeding, you're getting a half a, cu half a cup of starter, feed half a cup of water and feed half a cup of flour. And that's usually my thing, like keep it all even to begin with until you figure out what consistency that you like. But then those questions come in, you know, it's too thin, it's too thick. Well, there, there's absolutely wiggle room to play around with it and get it to the consistency that you're looking for. Yeah, just add more flour, add more water. I mean, I'm su not super particular about this ever. And so mm -hmm. I just, I never measure. And so sometimes maybe my baked goods are slightly denser. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're slightly, you know, fluffier. Yeah. It To me, they're always good. And so right. it's not... It's definitely not something to worry about, but that is a great resource because somebody can, I don't know, I view my time, especially with six kids in a business, I totally view my time as very valuable. Yes. And so this would be a slam dunk. Like, yes, I'm just going to buy your starter and then go on with life. And I have my starter without having to put all that effort into it. Yeah. I mean, I think so. Well, that raises a point too. A lot of people don't know you can make your own starter that that's something an option. Like if funds are tight or what, and you, or if you just like crafting and experimenting, you can right, it right. Own. You don't have to buy it. Yeah, you can. It just takes about a week of time, and then there's a lot of discarding in the in the establishing phase. I mean, I don't, I haven't discarded since I started my starter ten years ago. I don't, I don't discard. I just use it till it's about a half cup left, feed it, and carry on. Yeah. But, but in the beginning, there is that waste, and so you know, by buying a starter, that's that's always, although, yeah, like you said, it's fun. It's fun to experiment and learn something new in the kitchen as well. So I was going to mention something that I forgot to mention earlier that I've, I've learned probably since my last sourdough episode that apparently if you feed starters 
whole grain flour that you've milled fresh very long, it can get a funny smell. And I've actually have experienced that. And so for anybody who's experienced that, you can go back to just feeding it unbleached all purpose to every once in a while to get it back out of that. Have you heard of that? I haven't, but then again, I've only fed all purpose or bread flour. So this, right. is, this is a whole grain flour that you would feed, like a whole wheat? or an Yeah, so I feed mine with freshly milled flour. And over time, unless you switch back to all purpose every once in a while, it does take on a different kind of smell. And so, huh. I mean, you can bring it right back out of it, but I knew that, but I also never really heard an explanation of it. And then since then I've read more about it and it's, it's a thing. I just didn't realize that. Why is that? Why does it smell different? Do you know? I think it is the bran and the other parts of the wheat can, I don't know exactly, but it definitely has to do with those parts of the grain that cause it to have that smell. So That's yeah, I don't know. It can get kind of interesting over time. I'll have to link the resource that I found for that. I don't remember where I was reading about it. That's good to know. So what are some of your favorite recipes? Are you mostly a bread sourdough baker or do you incorporate it into other things in your kitchen? So um, when I started baking sourdough, I followed a lot of King Arthur recipes, but I wasn't happy with the consistency. I was getting more dense, almost like a sandwich bread consistency. And while there was nothing wrong with the taste, I just kind of envisioned that when I made sourdough bread, it was going to look like it came out of a bakery with those massive air pockets, you know? Uh huh. Um, so I was going more of a ciabatta loaf kind of a vibe. And so I found a woman online named Elaine. Um, her account is Elaine underscore foodbod on Instagram. And she okay. is an amazing resource for anyone interested in sourdough. And so I reached out to her and I just said, hey, this is my starter, it's alive and healthy. I don't know if it's me, if it's the starter, if it's the recipe, but it's so dense. And she said, you know what? I have a recipe that a lot of people have luck with, just give this a shot. And so I tried her basic master sourdough recipe and seriously, it was life-changing for me. It was exactly what I was looking for. Her master bread recipe? Yeah, it's just called her sourdough master recipe. And it's super okay. simple and approachable and it works every time. I guess, does it have more water to it to give it those big bubbles? For me, I think it was about the folding, the needs and the folds when making uh, the bread. Oh, and also oh. the rising. Those bread. are always the instructions that I ignore. <laughs> That's why my stuff never looks like yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't doing kneading and folding. I was using a mixer with a dough hook, right? right? Yeah, so, that's what I've always done too. Yeah, so this is a very hands-off recipe. Those air pockets come from natural fermentation, the interaction with the salt, the flour, and the water, and the starter, and that's why you're getting those bubbles. And then you're folding air into it when you do the kneads and folds. And the other thing I never did before her recipe was an overnight bulk proof. I always just let mine go on the counter for like, I think the longest I ever did was six hours. Okay. Like you would mix it all up and then just have it do its first rise and then bake it. Yeah. That was, that's what okay. I was doing. But now I do it on the counter, let it rise a bit, fold, rise, fold. And then I do an overnight proof in the ref or excuse me, on the counter. But after that, it goes in the refrigerator for a couple of hours. But what that is doing is it's preserving the stage that the dough has reached in terms of the air pockets and the bubbles, but it's chilling it. And the reason that we want it chilled is for scoring because then you get those nice crisp scoring lines. That's oh, that, that was my next question on the list. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Cause I've never been able to create these. I mean, I create loaves that are good. Like they will work for sure, but I've never had these artisan looking beautiful loaves. It's definitely chilled dough. Interesting. Okay. See, I'm just always in a hurry. That's the thing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so much time in a day. And when you want bread, you want bread, right? But if yeah. you can the whole process. So I like in Elaine's recipe, I do my initial, I feed the starter at about 10 a.m. in the morning. I do my initial combination of the ingredients at about four or five in the evening. There's a series of folds every couple of hours, put it on the counter overnight. In the morning you wake up, transfer it to the banneton, put it in the fridge for, for three, up to I think it's something like 12 hours, and bake whenever I have a minute. So it is about a 24 hour ordeal. But then you, you're really not hands-on very long with it. Not at all. And 
if you get into this, you know, if you get into this rhythm and you're doing it ahead of time, you could do something every day to always have bread. Yes, absolutely. I'm looking at her recipe now that I'm going to have to try it though. Cause I think that they're all so beautiful. And I even have my little scoring tool yeah. and I never have chilled my bread. So I've never had it look quite like that. <laughs> I think the longer you chill three hours is the minimum. If you were cool with leaving it in your fridge, if you had the space to leave it in there for like six hours, you would have much like when you bake cookies, right? Nicely chilled mm -hmm. dough that you can shape that doesn't stick. Cause if the dough is warm or room temperature and you go to score it, you're not going to get a nice crease or a nice slice. You know, it's going it, to, you're going to have to fight with it a little more, the colder, the better. Right. Yep. Yep. And so do you mostly use for your bread, do you use bread flour or do you use, uh, I use bread flour. Like I use all purpose flour. I just bought the same woman. I bought her book recently and that's where I've really started to experiment with different bread. So, um, she's got like a whole grain sourdough book and I experimented with a sweet potato loaf and a peanut butter loaf, which I love. Those were really good. And those have different hmm. flours like whole wheat and spelt. So up until I'd say maybe a year ago, it was always just straight sourdough, straight bread or all purpose flour. Now I'm starting to get into some different flavors, but we do things okay. with the discard. Like I do, um, I have a recipe on my website for cinnamon rolls with sourdough. Um, we've done pancakes, we've tried pizza crust, you know, so there's some experimentation with a few other things, but for the most part, I keep sourdough on hand for bread. For the bread. And it, it is a taste like none other. Totally. Especially when you're making it like that. I often am trying to, you know, I'm trying to do like a whole grain einkorn loaf just for health purposes. And it's good, but really the, the magic of the taste with sourdough is the, these all purpose bread flour, white flour <laughs> loaves. Those are they're amazing. Delicious. Tastes like they're straight from a bakery. So delicious. But then some people too, they, they might not know this, that if you're new to sourdough baking and your sourdough isn't tasting as sour as you like, and it has more of just a standard bread flavor, leave the sourdough on the counter and skip a feeding and it will accumulate more of a sour flavor. I probably don't have that problem very often. Usually it's the <laughs> other way around. I need to feed it a little bit more often and it's tasting really sour. Awesome. So you already mentioned Elaine. Do you have any other resources that are your favorites? Any other books? Elaine's Whole Grain Sourdough at Home is a favorite, but most of the time I don't really look at cookbooks for sourdough. I find a lot of things online. So I go through yeah. you know, Pinterest. Um, I have a friend who I got the starter from who, when I initially started, had me work with potato flour a little bit. So I, I experimented with that, but yeah, mostly it's just online. I'd say Pinterest is a big resource of inspiration for me. Oh yeah. You can find anything in a sourdough version online. Yes. Awesome. So we already talked about your website a little bit. What's the best place for people to find you? Um, I'm very active on Instagram. So I try to use Instagram as a resource for teaching and um, sort of sharing our eco-friendly homestead. So I am very active there and you can find updates daily. My website is where we sell our goods. And there's also a link from the website where I have started teaching um, homesteading classes. So these are basic skills like intro to beekeeping. Um, there's a beginner soap making class. It's just a way to try to make homesteading a little bit more approachable. I think a lot of people are frustrated because they're not sure how to be more eco-friendly or self-sufficient in their daily life. Homesteading and some of the skills I think are a good fit. Yes, I'm looking through your beautiful Instagram and your your farm that you share all over at Axon Root Homestead on, on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. I hope that you enjoyed listening in on our discussion about sourdough.